Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is a renowned expert on the science of spirituality, Dr. Mangia Samantha Lawton. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Who are we? Why are we here? What are we? These are the questions that our guest today has spent her life investigating. I found medical doctor Mangir Samantha Lawton while searching the New Dimensions radio website for interviews on consciousness. I listened to her interview on New Dimensions radio about her excellent book, Punk Science, and was very impressed. So I purchased Punk Science and studied it. And it is a truly impressive look into the nature of black holes, the universe, and much more. Mangir began her professional career as a medical doctor in England, but found that what she was being taught and how the medical system works was at odds with what she learned from her own enlightened experience brought on through yoga. She is the founder of the Black Hole Principle, which is an empowering view of the true nature of the universe, our place in it, and the amazing potential we all have to create harmony and live fully in concert with nature. In this informative podcast, Manjir and I dialogue on how we all got here, God concepts, cosmologies, and the nature of people's stories, and we get into what the nature of spirit, mind, soul, and black holes are. Dr. Manjir Samantha Lawton is a truly awakened individual with a wealth of knowledge and life experience, an amazing author and teacher, and I hope you enjoy her as much as I do. Hi, everybody. Do you guys want to know one of my secret weapons that helps me avoid being sick or feeling run down? It's Organifi Immunity. Organifi Immunity is a super high quality, certified organic drink mix that provides daily immune support and supports overall immunity. Organifi Immunity contains whole food vitamins C and D, whole food zinc, mushroom beta glycans, and provides only natural sweetness. Not only will you support your immune system, but you'll also get on-the-go superfoods in a delicious orange blend that is great for you and your kids and everyone will love it. My family and I love it and it's easy as tearing off the top of the package and mixing it with high quality drinking water and you can rest a little easier knowing that you're enhancing your immune system, which is probably a good idea now that so many people are spending so much time indoors, breathing indoor air and lacking sun exposure. Why not enjoy a little immune insurance while getting certified organic nutrients, superfoods and great taste that's quick easy, and effective. To get your Organifi Immunity and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, go to organifi.com and save 20% on any and all of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 during checkout. Enjoy Organifi. Hello, everybody. I don't know if you're aware, but there is a tremendous amount of confusion about stretching amongst athletes, therapists, and people in general. For example, here are some misconceptions that result in inefficient, ineffective stretching, or may even set you up for injury. A. You should stretch all the muscles in your body in a stretching session. This concept ignores the principle of balance. Think of a bicycle wheel that's out of balance. If you loosen all the spokes, will you get a balanced wheel? Everyone should stretch. Though stretching in general is good for people, there are many people with hypermobile joints. Stretching the muscles crossing such joints increases hypermobility, facilitating joint dysfunction, inflammation, degenerative changes, and pain. If you don't stretch hard enough, you won't get good results. This misconception is common amongst martial artists and unskilled teachers and practitioners of yoga. The truth is that you should consider a tight muscle like a crying baby and move into the stretch gently. Coupling stretching actions with conscious breathing actually enhances short and long-term benefits and long-term range of motion changes. Another common misconception is that you should do a good stretch before an athletic event to get the best results. Though this is a true concept, the problem is that most athletes use static stretching or long hold stretches to loosen tight muscles before athletic events. 
This, as I show in my scientific stretching program, results in a lot of muscle injuries. This is one of the most common reasons sprinters tear hamstring muscles, and in the course, I show you why this happens. The truth is, even when people have a solid understanding of the physical side of stretching, it's still only a mechanical process. The human body is much more complex than that. Mechanical approaches to stretching don't offer the true depth and power of stretching scientifically. It is well known in many healing arts and well described in books like Stanley Kellman's Emotional Anatomy that muscles, joints, and connective tissue all respond to one's thoughts, feelings, and emotions. This is clearly defined when we study the anatomy of yoga and the chakra system. Each part, be it internal or external, is linked to an associated chakra and corresponding mental-emotional challenges that are unresolved in the individual. Tight muscles often result from such energies being stored in the body. In scientific stretching, not only do I show you how to read the body from many perspectives, I give comprehensive explanations on this process and tips for using stretching, breathing, pressure release, and awareness so anyone can heal and restore emotional and mental balance to their body-mind as part of a holistic approach. Learning to stretch properly gives you a lot of information that can help you at every level of your being. For trainers, coaches, and therapists of any type, the information I share can be applied and greatly increase the effectiveness of one's therapeutic approach. Getting great results is always great for business. My new course, Scientific Stretching, will teach you not only the best way to stretch and improve your health and performance physically, but will help you see and realize the deeper mental, emotional, and spiritual benefits of stretching as well. One of the real benefits of the teachings I share is that you learn the language of the body and realize that it's always talking to you, giving you tips, and making suggestions as to where change is needed, be it your exercise program, stretching program, diet and lifestyle, your relationships, or even your overall disposition. In my new scientific stretching course, you will learn what stretching offers us for achieving health and well-being. My 1, 2, 3, 4 model of stretching. Stretching assessments for targeted stretching, including what types of stretching work best in different situations. The pressure release method for improving mobility and flow. The mental-emotional relationships to body restriction. The fascia-water relationship. And much, much more. As with all the courses in my scientific e-learning series, this course is extremely comprehensive and will give you a perspective on stretching that will help you and your clients see tremendous long-term results. For professionals using stretching as part of their practice, scientific stretching will give you the kind of advantage a calculator would have given you in math class before anyone else had one. Scientific stretching includes 11 videos with over 8 hours of education plus a PDF manual to help you follow along. I've developed these techniques in the 37 years of my clinical practice working with all sorts from all sports, so it has been time-tested over a lot of years. My clinical approach to stretching will support balancing your body, reduce injury, speed healing, free trapped emotions, help you read your body and maintain a healthy dialogue with it, differentiate and learn to use pre-event, post-event maintenance, and corrective stretching approaches effectively, and much, much more. Get started now at checkinstitute.com forward slash stretching. That's C-H-E-K institute.com forward slash stretching. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have Dr. Manjir Samantha Lawton, a British medical doctor. Well, she's actually Indian, aren't you, Samantha? Dr. <laughs> Manjir? <laughs> British. She's, she's, <laughs> oh, you're British, but obviously of Indian parents, right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was when, when I first heard an interview with you, I'm like, that is an interesting accent she has there. <laughs> it's got a mix of everything in there, kind of like pennies. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to to let everybody know that I came across your work, oh, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And the way I found it, I think I wanted to share with you is quite interesting. I love New Dimensions Radio. Uh, I think Peter Toms and his wife are both great interviewers, and they've interviewed a lot of the greatest minds in the world. And I was uh, on their website, and I searched consciousness and 23 episodes came up and I listened to every one of them and you were one of them. And so you were talking about your book, Punk Science, Inside the Mind of God. And I absolutely loved what you shared. And I just thought, wow, here's a blessing to the medical community worldwide, a medical doctor that actually thinks outside of the box and sees more to healing than drugs. 
And so I got your book and I studied it. And I also got your book, The Genius Groove, which I really thought was genius. <laughs> and I loved it. And so I said, I want to see if I can track Manjir down and have an interview with her. And you were kind enough to respond. And we've been going back and forth. And here we are. So uh, I just think your work's amazing. Your work into black holes, your black hole principles. So as you can see from the outline, there's a lot of things I want to get into with you. And I, I really think that you're sort of a, a bit of a hidden secret out there, you know, for, for the amount of knowledge that you share and the depth of your online courses and your newsletters. It's, 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 why, it's kind of the typical paradox of today. People that don't have a lot to say that are politically motivated and driven by money seem to flood the airways, but the wise people of the world are, you know, like diamonds buried in the dirt. And if you don't go looking for them, then you you never find them. And and so part of the reason for my podcast is to uncover these diamonds, and you're you're definitely one of them. So since many of my uh, listeners are probably not familiar with who you are and what your work encompasses, could you please give us all a biographical overview so we can get a sense of who you are? What inspires your heart to be so passionate to do all the amazing work that you do? <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> thank uh, you for <laughs> thank you for having me on your show and and you know the amazing work that you do as well. It's good to see someone who's uncovering such depths in your guests and, and uh, you know, just putting it out there as well. It's it's uh, really good to see this sort of depth out there, you know, and getting a, a lot of listeners. Um, so, yeah, I am, uh, as you said, from Indian um, parents uh, who were brought over to the UK to prop up the NHS system, and uh, they had me. And uh, <laughs> so I was born in the north of England. And like many good Bengali girls, I was expected to go into a medical career. And this was put very, very, um, it, you know, early on to me. <laughs> and uh, so I did end up going to medical school in London. And I, at that point, I was extremely skeptical of anything spiritual. I was such a Richard Dawkins fan, which is ironic because I met him later on. Um, but, um, and we can uh, talk about him. <laughs> I know. And, uh, so, you know, but I knew that something was wrong when I entered medical school and I couldn't put my f finger on it. And it, it was, I would say, to sum it up, it was a disrespect for life. And there was this lack of holism. There was this, um, I don't know, it just wasn't right. And that was from day one. And I'd been geared up to this my whole life. And then suddenly it was like, oh, what do I do now? Um, this isn't right for me. And uh, so I was in uh, one of the top London medical schools and um what happened was about three weeks in, somebody signed me up for a yoga class. And I went, oh, okay, free yoga class. I'll give it a go. <laughs> I've been doing Tai Chi as part of my, you know, sort of preparation for my uh, school exam. So great and, idea. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, try decided to go along. And as soon as I got there, I realized that I was in the right place at the right time and bear in mind at this point I was a skeptic so I was about 18 years old um so we have a different system to the US so um you can go to medical school straight from school um so yeah so it's a bit different you don't do the preclinical or whatever you do in the US I don't know what it's quite what it's called and it's called um, more brainwashing, brain, more brainwashing. <laughs> so you know we, I was just you know, thrown right in there into med school at 18. And uh, so basically in this yoga class, I ended up having a kundalini awakening, which I'd never heard of before. Um, but it switched that right on. Suddenly I felt totally connected to everything and, ev you know, everything that had ever happened. I guess people call it the universal mind. Um, but there's one thing to talk about it as a concept, but it's another thing to be in it and experience it. So that kind of switched me on. And I went through the next five years of med school um, with this parallel journey of um, 
of you know learning as much as I could whilst I was a student um I qualified as a doctor and then um I went on to become a general medical general practitioner and during that training uh what you do in the UK at least is you do a lot of hospital medicine and uh whilst I did that I also trained as a bioenergy healer so a, a compliment so I had a kind of sort of secret life and my real passion started to be you know this whole healing thing it works you know this bioenergy therapy that I'm doing it's working I'm seeing this amazing stuff happening in my healing clinic which was a secret I wasn't (laughs) telling my medical colleagues about this and I thought I wonder if you could explain the physics of this in such a simple way that even medical doctors can understand it. That's true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, medical doctors, they say they're into science, but really their science ends at the molecule. You know, when it comes to pharmacology, um, and that's about as deep as it goes. They have never, they don't really venture into quantum physics. They don't understand the whole idea that when you come to you know, talk about atoms and things that they don't really exist when it comes to physics, not in the way that we um, think of. And they, so they're still in this billiard ball um, method, and it, it it serves their system. I'm sorry, it serves their system and their purpose that we they do that because it it's how the pharmacology um, paradigm works. Um, so basically, I thought I've got to make something really simple. And and one of the things you ask, one of the things that motivated, it was seeing patients who, um, you know, I felt that they were being failed by the system. When we knew so much about reality from physics, from quantum physics, from string theory, from all these things, why were we? Why are we not bringing that knowledge into um, medicine? And if that could help us, just you know, use and explain things like Reiki and the bioenergy therapy that I was using and seeing that was so successful and just help our patients just that little bit. I'm not saying throw everything out that we already know, but you, if the, if the science is a stumbling block, then what if we explain the science and we can use those together? So, and especially working in the pediatric ward and seeing these children who haven't even chosen their paradigm yet yet they're being subject to pretty intense therapy, you know, for leukemia and things like that, and and going, you know what, what if we knew the science, we could maybe um, have an adjunct to the therapies they're having and see see if that helps. Um, So it was really to try and explain the physics in a really simple way. I'm not a physicist, (laughs) and um, and, and my philosophy is um, if I understand it, then, you know, if I can put it in a way that I understand it, then hopefully everybody else can understand it and get it really, really simple. Um, That's not how I ended up. So (laughs) I ended up um, discovering something which you alluded to earlier called the black hole principle. Um, but the, the real drive and the, the passion, that's where it started. And from there, really, um, the Black Hole Principle, since I discovered it in 2003, it really has been a core of my life. I say it's the boss. <laughs> and like It takes me where I, <laughs> I, I need to go and um, you know, opens whatever doors that n- need to happen. And really, that's at the core. But from there... Um, I'm really interested in how, as human beings, we are not told the truth. We're not told the truth about physics. We're not told the truth about medicine. We're not told the truth about our history. And I really have a passion of uncovering that, we, where we have the evidence for certain things, but it's not being brought to the public, to bring that to the public and, and put it in a really simple way. And um, that's kind of <laughs> my passion, the, the discoveries, the evidence, the science and putting that in. A, and uh, and part of that is because I, I do now, ever since that Kundalini happened, I, I live a multidimensional life as well. My consciousness sort of, you know, goes there. But this the science and the multidimensionality in me go hand in hand. You know, there's, there's no paradox. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Two things came to my mind while you were talking. 
one, there's a Zen riddle that came to my mind while you were telling about your awakening in yoga, particularly since you were a beginner at it. Somebody approaches a Zen master and says, Master, if I study with you, how long will it take me to reach enlightenment? And the master smiles and looks at him. He said, it may take 15 seconds and it may take 35 years. It's up to you. (laughs) 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 And so, you know, what, what I, when I heard you tell that story in, in your interview uh, with Peter Toms on new dimensions radio, my first thought was she must be an old soul and she came here to do this work. And if she hadn't have had that enlightenment, she would have gotten dangerously trapped in the medical system. So it was great spirit giving her what the Buddhists call the touch or the Zen masters call the touch where you get the touch and boom, it happens. You're one with it all. The other thought that came to my mind, which, which uh, I think is very interesting for you, if you're not familiar with this woman, have you ever heard of the holistic nurse Margaret Newman. I'm not sure. This... No, no, I didn't think so. <laughs> okay, uh, I will email you a couple of slideshows about her work, and I'll email you a link to her book. You will be blown away. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because Margaret Newman studied holism and holistic health and consciousness. And for 35 years, she tried to use the wisdom available in the perennial philosophy and in her other research, including people like my hero at Zach Bentov's research and work. And she just pretty much got nothing out of the medical system, even though she was a highly respected nurse. But her work is absolutely mind blowing. And you'll be amazed at how she ties it all together and what she was trying to put into the hospital system a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I'll share that with you after we finish. Um, You know, I, I was browsing your website and you have a program coming up titled, How Did We All Get Here? <laughs> and though there are many questions I'd love to explore with you today, I cannot resisting uh, the question up front because, you know, that's one of the primordial questions. The yogis say, if you figure out who you are and what you are, then then the secrets are revealed. So in your opinion, how did we all get here? <laughs> Well, at the moment, you know, I don't want to go too deeply into this, but we're about to do a retreat on this. Um, But we are in a situation in the world where people are going, what's happening? What's And there's this great awakening going on. And uh, for some people, they kind of um, were expecting something to happen. And uh, so... Why is it that all governments and things have like the same sort of scripts? And uh, I feel that unless you understand the true nature of reality of what this planet and other planets really are all about, that we are living in this multidimensional reality. And elements of other dimensions of consciousness are at play in not just you know, just in a little way, but in a big way with humanity and always have been. So we we tend to see science, space and time as totally fixed. But in, I believe that in deep, the deep past, that we're going through spirals of time. And uh, this is quite an ancient idea as well, that we're going through spirals of time and we go through spirals where the the um, dimensions come together and then come apart. And when they come apart, it's less obvious to us that uh, there are many dimensions to reality. And we're one of these periods at the moment where um, we seem quite separated and physical reality seems to be what we call 3D. Is I love the fact that it's like <laughs> this podcast is 4D. <laughs> um, but, ah, yes, yeah. baby. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we're, we're living in 3D and a lot of people on the planet right now think that that's all there is. But there are tons and tons of people from all walks of life who are having these interdimensional experiences and going, gosh, what's going on? Am I losing my mind? Am I, you know, there's a ton of, there's this big awakening and it's been 
and I think what's going on at this time in the planet um, is we are starting to step through that door as a collective humanity to understand the true nature of of um, this interdimensional process, not just that's at play now, but has been at play throughout history and in ancient times as well. Um, so that's the sort of thing we're going to be talking about on this retreat to help people to make sense of what's going on right now. Um, so it's not just about how did we get here as in how do we exist, although it's covering a little bit of that, but also, um, you know, from a standpoint of current events, um, how did it come to this? And why did some people expect something like this to happen? And looking from the perspective of ancient, so looking at deep time, looking at modern as in what's happening and, and making some uh, predictions about the f- possible futures. And um, so, yeah, <laughs> so that that's coming up. It's great. And I, I hope your workshop is well attended. Um because people need this kind of information and we must need it because there's a lot of people from Greg Braden to Barbara Han Clow to many others that are giving workshops pointed in this very direction. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're aware of all these types of things. Um, there's a couple things I want to share when I work with my soul, which is constantly, but I, When I have big questions, I go into meditation and I ask my soul a question. And usually what happens is I find myself somewhere in the astral dimension where the answer to the question is being shown to me as an experience, as though I'm actually standing right there and I'm there just like I'm sitting here talking to you right now. And when I ask the question, how did we all get here? Because I've asked that for years and years, but the answer is always the same. The answer is quite interesting. My soul tells me that the reason you're all here is because you dreamed each other into existence. You're all part of the collective. You're all part of the divine mind. And each of you represents a unique experience that that the divine or source wants to have to express its own potentials. So what my soul is telling me, there's not a, a Cartesian answer to the question, how did we all get here? It's much more mythologically based in the sense that a myth is a story that tells itself, and a myth is also something that never happened but is happening all the time. So th- that's my own perspective on it. I don't know how that sits with yours. The other thing I wanted to share with you is, are you familiar with Gene Gebser's work in in consciousness and structure stages? No, I don't think so. (laughs) There's a book that I want to share with you that's a nice summary of his work that's very, very good. I think it'll blow your mind. It's called Seeing Through the World by Jeremy Thomas. In Gebser's model, which is his book, the ever present origin is probably about 700 pages. It's very deep reading, but it's potent as hell. And I've been studying it uh, intensively because I'm writing my own new book, workbook, and putting an online program together to support people through these times. But in Gebser's model, consciousness begins with the archaic level, which is the formation of the earth. Then it goes to the magic level, which relates to the biology of our bodies and our fusion into nature. Then it goes to the mythic level, which is when the uh, individual becomes progressively more self-aware. And it then goes into the mental level where we're at now, where ideas become the common trade within which consciousness flows between people. Whereas before our consciousness was very much like an animal or an insect in the archaic, and it became very much like a, a a biological relationship in the magic realm. And then it became based on stories to try to explain the mysterious, and verbal language became prominent in the mythic realm. And then in the mental realm, we're at the ideas, which as we all know, is a very dangerous level. But Gebser says, 
in his work that we're essentially now merging into the integral level. Ken Wilber's research shows there's only about 2% of the world population currently at that level, but some of the descriptors for the integral level are that time begins to change its relationship and that the past, present, and future begin to merge in a person's consciousness. He calls that the integral stage diaphanous, which he uses to express seeing through. And he says, when you reach the integral level, you see through all the different levels of consciousness and that to be integral, you transcend, but you must include. So you cannot lose awareness of the earth and the, and the essential basis of the earth as the underpinning of our experience here in this three-dimensional world. You must not lose your fusion with nature or you no longer see the spirits of nature, the plants, the animals, the trees, the microorganisms as contributors to the great chain of being. You see them as objects. We must adhere to and understand the nature and power of story to, to keep people together and in harmony with each other in the world. And we must learn to use ideas to create harmony in our lives. If we enter the integral world, but we have not got those other things in place, then what happens is with the acceleration of time and the intensity of consciousness, we end up face to face with all the backlog material we've swept under the rug by transcending without including, which Jung would call being trapped in your unconscious and many would call being put face to face with your personal and collective shadow. So the model Gebser left, and, and you know he died quite some time ago. I think Seeing Through the World might have been published around, uh, sorry, not Seeing Through the World. Uh, I think The Ever-Present Origin was published around the time I was born, if I remember right, 61. Mm. So he was really prophetic. He was a friend of Jung's and he knew Picasso. He was really a guy who was very connected to the great minds of his day. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are when you look at it through that perspective. Mm, yeah, I, I'd be interested to see exactly what they mean by the mythic. Um, I think there's a tendency to look back and look at our relationship that our ancestors had with, say, gods and things like that and call it mythic and not understand that these are actually multidimensional experiences that people are having again. And um, so people are having that again. So if you sort of go through this phase and go, oh, well, we were archaic and then we were mythic and it's like, uh, and then we needed to tell stories to explain everything. And it's like, no, you know what? People in the past weren't stupid. They were just recording these multidimensional experiences just as we are now. And um, so when you have a really full-blown multidimensional experience and you are you are in a different reality and like you're saying it's very important to be grounded in that because we know that um you know there are people in um our uh, mental health worlds that are not grounded um so you know it's very important to be grounded in that but the people who are grounded just go whoa you know i really need to write this down uh, this is incredible. I need to tell everybody about this. And you can see that kind of impulse in every single religion, every single um, legend, so-called, everything. And the people in the mental era have look, lost touch with that, look back at that and go, hmm, this must be people who don't understand the sort of science that we do and, um, you know, and therefore have to make up stories. It's like, are you kidding me? Have you seen what they built? Have you seen what the sort of precision yes. they have in their buildings? And you're telling yes. me that these people are suddenly so dumb that they have to make up a story about what the sun is, about what this is. No, 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 they're not making up stories. This is their reality that you just don't understand. Yeah, totally in harmony with you there. And and just to answer your query on Gebser's approach to myth, it's as comprehensive, if not more comprehensive than any I've studied. And I've studied a lot, including all of Joseph Campbell's works. I've studied 
the collective works of Jung for over 20 years, Ken Wilber's collected works. And his approach to myth is very, very, uh, shall we say, realistic, grounded, and very, very clear. And uh, by no means is he using the concept myth like people do in the mental level to indicate a lie. It's much, much deeper and more thorough. In fact, one of the things that Gebser highlights is during the magical period, which came after the archaic, that the cave art and rock art often showed people that had no mouths because listening was their primary mode of surviving. And it was only in the mythic period that art began to have mouths because storytelling became such an important means of seeking to understand the grand mysteries of life and what was happening to them. And so uh, his grounding in myth and my grounding in myth is something that's very practical, but also very multidimensional. In fact, he talks a lot about how our awareness of what the soul is emerged in the mythic period and gives a lot about what spirit is and what soul is very, very extensive and complete. Mm. And you're right that, that this is what drives me to write and to share. I've had many, many union experiences in my life through Tai Chi, through meditation, uh, through plant medicines. And so uh, I, I have a constant inflow of open windows. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, like you, you know, when you when you see a greater reality and you see that that reality is helping you engage life in ways that make it more meaningful and more fulfilling, then our natural urge, it would be no different than if you saw someone stuck on the side of the road with a flat tire and it was obvious they didn't know what to do. We'd pull over and say, oh, let me help you. Do you have a jack in the trunk? Well, here's how you do this. Now you know what to do. It's not that hard at all. So when people are stuck with their metaphorical intellectual flat tires, then people like us have to come along and show them how to find the jack and how to use it. And what does a jack do? It takes something higher, <laughs> <laughs> one notch at a time. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, Manjir, in my work with patients and clients over the last 37 years, I've found that there are three things that have a huge impact on people's physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health. And I'll outline them for you, and I'll give you a little preamble, and then I'd love it if we can go through a series of questions, because I'm very interested in your concepts here. One, their Imago Dei, which is Jung's archetype that symbolizes the image of deity, and Jung says himself, I'm not sure if our Imago Dei creates us or if we create it. I found very consistently that most people's chronic health, relationship, and religious or spiritual challenges emanate from their belief about, what, about God and what God wants. Two is their cosmology. Whatever their conscious or unconscious creation myth is, which is inclusive of what they feel will happen when they die, often their cosmology is a reflection of their Imago Dei contents, which leads to their story number three. Today, uh, we have lost touch with the real functions, importance, and meaning of myth, yet people are unaware that regardless of their myth being conscious or unconscious, it has a huge impact on their lives and the beliefs it inspire, inspires and expresses, the behaviors that it expresses, and the choices are the result of a person. They produce the circumstances. In other words, a person's beliefs and behaviors are an expression of their story, which is an expression of their cosmology, which directly links back to their beliefs about God. Rudolf Steiner taught anthroposophic physicians that whenever we're dealing with chronic illness or disease in patients, it's important to identify what he called their secret story. An example of a secret story can be seen when someone convinces themselves that they must go to church each week to worship God, but on the inside, they have a lot of anger and pain toward God because of all the pain and suffering that they have endured or because they feel they've sinned too much to be led into heaven and are doomed. They're caught in a love-hate relationship with God and a fear of not being loved by God. I've seen this secret story in many cases of anxiety, depression, and disease. 
So, Manjir, I'd love it if you could share your perspective on each of these aspects of human life and share what you believe is true for each of these three factors based on your own life experience and research. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I think in um, in terms of being a medical doctor, I was one of the ones who actually took the time to ask, you know, say somebody came into A and E and sort of you, you call it the emergency room. Sorry, the emergency room, and um, yeah, what was going on just before X Y Z happened. And it's like, oh, I was looking at my old photo albums and then suddenly I couldn't breathe. And, you know, so it's like when you take the time to ask about the emotional dimension, even in the emergency room, it's just amazing what you can find. And um, I remember having a conversation when I became a GP um, later on. Of course, as a GP, you see lots of sore throats. And a colleague, um, people with sore throats, sorry, a colleague said to me, we want to train patients not to come to the surgery with sore throats. They're just so boring. We don't want to see anyone because we can't do anything. And I said, no, sore throats are interesting. And he was like, what? <laughs> because every single sore throat person with a sore throat has a story behind it. There's something going on in their lives. There's something happening. And I find that fascinating. And he just looked at me like I was out of my mind. <laughs> he really did. Um, but, you know, that connection, uh, for example, this woman, she lost her father. She came to the surgery the day after, and um, she was fine. She just seemed to be, she was in that sort of denial stage, I guess. And um, about two days later, what happens? Massive sore throat. It's the grief coming out. It's that acknowledgement and the expression of that grief. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're if you clued in and you ask the right questions, you can see this happening. In chronic disease, a patient just um, with quite a rare autoimmune um, syndrome, sort of um, once just out of the blue said, I know when this happened to me. It was when my husband left me with five kids. She said, wow. that's that's the moment it happened to me. Mm -hmm. And she just knew. And so it's having that awareness to make that sort of um, emotional connection. What I do in my work now, as I said, I trained as a um, bioenergy practitioner in the year 2000 uh, with the Plexus Institute. And that evolves, uh, the way that I was trained was sort of evolved sort of waving your hands about in people's energy field, as it were, and correcting it. And there's all sorts of, you know, uh, different manoeuvres that we do with that. And uh, as I said, I started to have a lot of success in that, that field. But now I've learned how to do that remotely. And uh, the way that it's gone with me, and that's my particular path, is that I'm able to go into a person's field find the um, emotional and um, subconscious kind of triggers, just kind of psychically really, and interdimensional and past life. And there's a lot of people who work like this, but this is my particular inroad. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of times you have to go to that different dimensional aspect of their story. So it is their story. But sometimes it doesn't just stop at this particular life. It's going into past lives. It's going into different dimensions sometimes. Um, and becoming aware of that, becoming conscious of that, and you go through the layers, sometimes in one, two, three sessions. And once you've really got there, suddenly the moment of transcendence happens. And that is amazing. I've had all sorts of incredible things happen in this clinic from angelic experiences, fairies dropping in, shape-shifting happening. You know, it just becomes this amazing opening up of the underlying reality. Um, of uh, And so really having gone through the whole lot, gone from emergency medicine, being at the acute side, um, you know, I've done – obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, elderly care medicine, you know, I've done um, all of these uh, areas, I've done general been a general practitioner, I've been a bioenergy therapist, um, I can, I've been, you know, done the spectrum, and I know that really the root cause, really to get to the root cause, you have to do this interdimensional work. 
Yes. Um, so if that involved g- going through the emotions up to uh, past lives and sometimes into multidimensional realities, people make contracts on a galactic level yes. um, that they're sometimes not aware of. Um, they have... I, I've met many uh, people. I've tuned into many people's galactic teams, galactic missions, and um, this sort of thing. And there may be some people sitting there going, uh, "This is nonsense." Blah blah blah. Fair enough. Um, you know. <laughs> well, you can't on. deny you can't deny results, though. And yeah, you get the you're, results. You're, you're pretty safe on my podcast because I talk about these things all the time. <laughs> I do that work, and actually, one of my recent podcasts was an expose of my recent past life regression with a quantum hypnotherapist that does regression work. And we shared uh, my regression, which was the second time I had a past life regressionist work on me. So uh, you don't have to worry about any people having that problem. And if they do, then this is a gift to them because uh, it won't be the last time they hear it, I imagine. (laughs) I suppose, yes. So having gone through that whole spectrum um, these are my conclusions about what really is getting to the heart of things. And everything has its own timing as well. It's like, as practitioners, we have to get out of the judgment of disease. You know, it is, mm-hmm. there's something that there's, the body is doing its own thing. It's doing, yeah. it, it's got its own, the soul is doing its own thing. It's, it's got its own timing. It's got its own wisdom. And yeah. if we work on something and um, we don't get to the bottom of it and it's, uh, or something persists, it's there for a reason as well. So we, as practitioners, we have to be unattached to outcomes and understand that, that there's something that needs to be there for as long as it needs to be there. Yes. And that's important as well. You're not doing it. You are assisting, but you're not the one that's fixing, healing, anything. You know, it is the um, the intelligence of the universe that has brought this through into the physical in the first place. And, um, you know, although you can assist and uh, maybe get to the root of it, maybe in that particular moment, you don't fully get to the root of that. And that's okay, too. Yeah. And um, as a pra- as practitioners, we need to let go of that a- uh, attachment as well. Well, it's interesting that you shared what you just shared, because when you see what Margaret Newman says about illness and disease, it's uh, almost as though you just read it out of her book. <laughs> well, these are, I call it the university because it's like the intelligence of the universe teaches you in itself so it's come to the same information has come to people throughout the ages <laughs> and you know you can read a book that's thousands of years old and you can recognize it and go that principle is truth yes. you know i can pick up the new testament and i can see a truth in there i can pick, pick up any sacred book and i can see truths in there truths have come to people throughout the ages to so many different people and yeah. so it's, it's not surprising that, <laughs> that that's uh, come through. A couple of things rose up in me. Are you familiar with the questions that a real shaman typically asks someone that comes to them with a disease? People tell me that I work in a shamanistic way sometimes, but I've like I, I do I do something that now I I know is called soul retrieval. Yes. Um but I didn't I <laughs> didn't really know it was called that. I just hit upon it through this process of discovery. Um so I don't know what the actual process is, but people have told me that. So what are the questions? Well classically in the in the study of shamanism you'll find these questions reoccurring and real skilled shaman know to ask these questions because the answer to these questions almost always tells the shaman where soul loss occurred. The questions are, when did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop enjoying stories? When did you stop enjoying being alone with yourself? And when did you lose your sense for the magic, mystery, and awe of life? The answer to those five questions are highly diagnostic as to where in the timeline some kind of traumatic event happened where soul loss occurred or where there's fragmentation of the person's psyche. 
Yeah, that that's very good questions. I guess what I do is I go into somebody's field and I find that. Um, so sometimes even when some th- event has been long forgotten, um, and let's not forget that sometimes these things happen in the womb and as yes. somebody is incarnating. And mm-hmm. uh, so if you have um, a child who um, has s- some you know, d- imbalance, you could say, even though I don't want to put any judgment on it because everything is in balance all the time. So nothing, I- imbalance is not imbalance, if you know what I mean. But say yeah. we, we have something and they're presenting with something, always ask the mother, if you can, um, what happened whilst you were pregnant. Yeah, and there's so many times the mother will just go, "Oh gosh," and she knows. Yes, she knows. Um, mm-hmm. She remembers it's been her shameful secret, and she hasn't said anything. There's yeah. been some major row. There's been, you know, there's been something. So, um, you know, we don't want to put any <laughs> blame and, and things on this, but um, you know, th- it's an interesting line of inquiry so um yeah sometimes you have to go into the and then i discovered something called that i call pay it forward (laughs) which is um where you kind of find the primary emotional injury as it were i don't want to put judgment on it but and then um basically the the life until that moment gets rewritten and you can see this yeah. Of, of history go through and they're literally their their life up till now has and sometimes you ask a client can you remember what you what was bothering you they can't remember and you can't remember either because it just the energy of it got re- erased and uh, you're only talking about it 10 minutes before and then you just can't remember it um yeah. so sometimes there's, there's these different levels that i've discovered and uh, so if that's shamanistic, I don't know people say that, but these are just things that I've got through the university, you know, <laughs> that the consciousness itself teaches you. Yes. What I'd love to hear you expand a little more on, uh, because you haven't really included it in your response, is what's your thoughts on the connection between people's what I call God model and their cosmological model? and the way they engage life and how that impacts them physically, emotionally, and mentally, or spiritually? Um, It's interesting because I don't see so many people who are as much in those constructs. Right. Um, But I do... (laughs) (laughs) I do know that um, these things... I mean, I did... um, Once did a a lecture somewhere, and um, there was someone who was a... Uh, what did he do? Spirit release, you know, yes. where he was removing entities and things like that. And he said, uh, "You know what? Ma- the majority of what I release, he goes, it's Catholics." Yes, and I was me, like, "Me too, <laughs> really." And he goes, "Because Catholics don't believe they're good enough to go to the light after they pass over." And I was like, "Wow!" So that's something that personally, for me, I don't find p- beings or spirits of that sort of construct. Um, so I think it's just probably who I'm working with but I am aware aware of these things um so the most of the people that are attracted to working with me have sort of um not uh, yeah they're they're more of a galactic and multidimensional um uh sort of uh, view of the world and um so um but I I can totally see that that does exist and that can restrain when I was working with um patients in the national health system you know yes. definitely came across people who you know were coming up against the constraints of maybe their religion and the that sort of world view and they just couldn't tip over emotionally um to um to free them their own mind from their conditioning um yes. so yes that absolutely plays a part but it's not something that day to day I'm seeing personally much of uh, just yeah. because of the sort of clientele I attract I think well, the other thing is, is as we know from quantum physics, the experiences that any of us have are directly related to the questions we're asking and how we ask them. And so each of us has our own unique background, our own training and our own kind of view of the world, which is the basis of the questions that we ask and how we go about getting the answers. Uh, but I, I just am grateful to hear your views on it, which is why I wanted to ask you. Um, 
The the next question I wanted to ask is, an individual's Imago Dei cosmology and story all have an impact on how one perceives reality. Now, reality is something that's been discussed philosophically, scientifically, for as long as people have been writing about it, and there's not much agreement at all on what reality is, especially since quantum physics sort of burst the bubble on everybody. I'd love it if you can share your thoughts on what reality is, and is there an independent, a reality independent of the perceiver in your model? Mm, it's interesting because we haven't really touched on um, the black hole principle yet, but um, well, you can do that if it'll help <laughs> you answer. Uh, we we can be flexible. <laughs> But um, so I think what we're talking about when we're talking about reality, um, we've got to distinguish between um, below the speed of light and above the speed of light, as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's a misnomer sometimes where people think that what quantum physics is saying is that um, it's just about our perception of reality that determines reality. Um, but I go more with the Amit Goswami kind of view of things, which is mm-hmm. consciousness is fundamental. It's like the fundamental um, is not even a strata or anything because it's beyond anything material. So it's, he mm-hmm. calls it the ground of all being. Yes, I've studied his work a lot and I've interviewed him. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've spoken, had the pleasure of uh, meeting him quite a few times luckily and um so we um yeah so basically his view is that everything emanates and the view of you know she's passed away now but elizabeth reisha was one of the physicists who was um working with this conscious research group she was one of the pioneers uh peter russell um you know fred allen wolf you have these group of ma- maverick physicists who sort of looked at quantum theory and went Oh, okay. What does this mean? And yes. um, so the extrapolation of um, this concept that um, observation collapses a wave function into a particle. Uh, what does this mean? Okay. So um, what is it that is observation? Does it need something that is consciousness? Right. So conscious. Well, then what is consciousness? And so the conclusion that actually material reality comes from uh, the ground of all being, which is consciousness. Um, so that is different from um, it's just about my perception and uh, and everything. It, nothing exists if it um, if I personally am not perceiving it. But it's we we live in a sort of multi dimensional reality, don't we? Where we have absolutely all of everything the whole universe within us. And uh, so what is the I that's perceiving? Well, we are the universe. We are all the infinities, you know. So um, so there's different ways of looking at it. But, I mean, the one that I really, that makes sense in terms of the black hole principle and all of the um, effects that we see there as well as consciousness is like the fundamental and uh, that's the ground of being, and that gives rise. So um, that is reality. And, and uh, you know, as we're probably going to go on to talk about, the infinity at the center of black holes is the same infinity, um, no matter what level that you, you're at. And mm-hmm. that gives rise to all of the different um, dimensional realities. So, um, And the one that we call 3D is the stuff that's below the speed of light. Um, yes. But uh, that's kind of like light in disguise as um what we call physical reality but fundamentally that is that is still the light of consciousness um, yes no matter what you're looking at it's still all the one light of consciousness yes um, so um <laughs> it's it's simple really i mean i think we put too much like if we are trying to categorize things too much sometimes when if we get back to the simplicity of the universe, the simplicity that creates infinite complexity. Um, so, um, but understand that everything is coming from that um, that ground of being of the one consciousness. Um, and you know that may be just too simple for some people, but I think the universe is simple. It's simple, but it gives rise to infinite complexity 
through a fractal pattern, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I understand. I mean, one way I describe reality, if one of my students asks me what reality is, I say reality is what's happening right now. Yeah. That's reality. If I drop a rock on your foot, you'll know it's happening. If, if uh, you're being locked into your houses because you believe in a virus that's supposed to be dangerous, then that's your reality. If you're like me and you live on top of a mountain and you're healthy and you say, well, it's just another organism and the same way you handle that is the way you handle yourself always. Be healthy and have a spiritual practice and know that if something comes and gets you, then there's a gift of awakening being given. That's reality. Um, I, I may have questions on this later, but, uh, I thought I'd share something with you because I've, I've been investigating consciousness for a long time and I went into meditation and I asked my soul, I said, could you please give me a simple definition of consciousness? And my soul said, yes, consciousness is love becoming aware of itself. I love that, yeah. Because the other aspect that I didn't mention, I totally agree. It it's the emanation of unconditional love. Yes, and everything consciousness is the ground of all being. We talk about love and light, like it's like unconditional love is the force that creates everything. And you might say, oh well, that is how can you say that when terrible things happen in the world? Well. It's unconditional love exploring itself. Yes. And reflecting back, like the Taurus, it's reflecting mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, absolutely. And when you – I've had a few experiences in my life where I have touched a little bit of that amazing force of unconditional love. One of them was – I wrote about it in the Genius Groove when I uh, first saw an angel. And um, just the pure energy of that. And most people experience this when they have a near-death experience. Um, luckily for me, I didn't have to go through that to, um, to you know, experience that unconditional love, and it's never left me. Just the reality, yeah. underlying reality of it. So I totally agree with you. Um, that it's not just light, it's love. Even when it looks to you like there's no love in the world, um, the you can't change that reality. Everything is actually unconditional love. And sometimes to make sense of things, you have to go up a level to a different dimension um, because you go, oh, how can you say everything is unconditional love when... You know, that woman here has, has lost her two babies and um, what a terrible, she's in utter grief and what a terrible thing to happen. Well, you know, I, I you know, not to take away from that grieving, um, but there's a lady that came to me in that situation and she didn't actually tell me that she had, had been through this experience and I picked up that she had had suffered this grief. And uh, the the... A spirits of these children came through and um, basically they were doing something that is um, the equivalent that only children under the age of two that pass under the age of two can go to a certain dimension and they were working with her spirit, the, the mother's spirit, in order to do a particular, um, their particular soul work. Yeah, and um, they were sort of going, "Hey, mom, we're we're working with you," you know, and they could only do that by seeding themselves momentarily in three D, and then you know working from the other side with her, and that's mm -hmm. not to diminish what you know the grief that she's going through in three D, of course not, um, but it's only when you go up a level and get this sort of answer that you can start to make sense of things. Um, so. Um, there is that sense there, there is that love there, but from the 3D perspective, sometimes we're not so aware. But, you know, that's part of the whole point, like you're saying, love becoming aware of itself. You know, I agree with you, but I also feel 
it's also important for people to realize, especially a culture, a worldwide culture now that's caught in the mental realm of ideas and uh, images and data as more real than life itself, that going down, and this is why I feel the structure stages of consciousness are so important, because when we go into the mythic realm, everything is connected. Whether there's a dark force working against a light force, or whether it's a myth about lightning or a myth about narcissists and seeing your reflection. Ultimately, once you go to the mythic realm, everything connects. And if you go to the magical realm, then you realize that what we think of as plants, trees, and even stones are not objects, they're beings. So having worked with many, many depressed people and suicidal people, when I teach them how to connect to their soul and how to have conversations with plants and trees and how to pray for their food and connect to the spirits of the food, the most common reaction I get is they just burst out into tears and they realize that this illusion of isolation is really a product of their own programming and and that by changing their perspective and accessing because for example, I tell people that what, what scientists call junk DNA based on my own spiritual investigation is the DNA record of our entire evolution in nature. And it gives us access to every single living creature, not only on the planet now, but that's ever been here. And, and that junk DNA is the most comprehensive antenna system that we know of in our domain of reality. And because consciousness is ubiquitous, it is one, talking to a plant or a stone or an animal or a tree is really talking to the tree of yourself or the crystal of yourself. It's only because we've got this heavily dualistic concept, which separates us from everything and even everybody else that we think that these kinds of more shamanic based connections are woo woo. But when you follow the history of religion back, it all goes straight to shamanism. So along the way, it got edited and edited and edited for purposes of power and control, as you're very aware, but we've, we really lost touch. So sometimes I find taking people backwards into the lower structure stages is very important because if I take them to higher dimensional stages, they still don't have the awareness that the plant that they've been watering every four days is trying to get its attention and give it and give them love. Or the dog that they keep taking to the vet is carrying their karma for them to try to save Ooh. them from dying. It's a big one. So I like to bring them back into the earth and say, okay, now that you've got your feet on the soil, let's go up to the higher dimensions because you you need a tail on your kite or you end up with the kind of people that you see having drug-induced or spontaneously induced kundalini risings in emergency wards and in psych wards. Very important to be grounded. Very important. I, I'm not sure that the, you know, the communication um realm is because sometimes i've met quite a few people who it can be a bit much i mean i <laughs> everyone knows about the story about basil maybe um about um i have a blog on my um website if you want to go look about what should we eat when we're multidimensional um because i, I bought a little plant when uh, i was in a rush coming back from the gym and uh, just picked up a living basil plant to cook with and when i started to take the leaves off i suddenly had this ow ow yes and, like, yeah. what? and um you know it's not the first time i've had a, a plant communication but i mean it was like the first time from a little plant bought from the supermarket and um so uh, i mean this basil plant i mean it just turned out to be such a soulmate of mine and yes just grew and grew and grew taught me so many things about um the way that plants communicate through um vibrations and colors and, and oh my goodness and uh 
the, the tr- I mean, what the trees do for us is is just incredible. Um, I, and it, but for ages, I didn't know what to eat. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes this is really an important side, but sometimes separation is also important. That even though it's an illusion. Because if we were just overwhelmed, like, you know, the desk that I've got this computer on has a consciousness, um, the bed that you lie on has a consciousness. And, you know, if you are just overwhelmed by these messages all the time, uh, which some people are, and they're, they're not the ones that are in the psyche wards, they're the ones that are actually, you know, functioning and spiritual but um it can be a bit overwhelming so even i have to ch- tone it down a little bit um because i just couldn't live if i was listening to all of the messages um that i was getting from all of the beings around which people call inanimate objects you know and um so i think that's also important to to you know to have that awareness but um it can be overwhelming i really didn't know what to eat for a while then the um parsley italian parsley <laughs> started to chat to the basil saying what's the big deal this is what we were made for we are grown the humans eat us and then we are reincarnated and um this is our so this is our purpose this is what we do it's we we know we're going to be reincarnated um but the basil wasn't having any of it (laughs) so um yeah so if you want to read the whole story um you know go to my blog what to eat when you're (laughs) multidimensional well i i actually addressed this and i've i put together probably one of the most comprehensive programs in the world on basically i called the program the honest vegetarian and I looked at all the issues and all the different belief systems around diet with my senior instructor, Matthew Walden, who's from London, and he's a naturopath and an osteopath and a very genius man. And we put together like a five or six, two plus hour podcast series called The Honest Vegetarian. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that, because I've investigated this a lot, because I've had to rehabilitate countless vegetarians uh, who are very sick, but spend hours trying to convince me of their philosophy. And I say to them, if that was true, you wouldn't be here spending a lot of money to see me because you're not feeling well. But one of the concepts that I help people understand, and I will share the prayer that I use with food is that when we eat something, we are not killing the food. The food is gaining new life in us. The food, the basil is becoming manjir. The chicken is becoming manjir. So when I pray, before I eat food, I say, thank you, my dear food, for the love you have given Mother Earth, for the love you have given Mother Universe, and the love you are giving me now. It was. It is with great love and respect that I invite you into my being. Please join me now in body, mind, and spirit so that together we can make the world a better place for all living beings now and in the future. So when I have plants or animals at the soul level expressing fear, I let them know you're not dying. We're going to work together to make the world a better place for everybody And I'm inviting you to join me because I need your help and the world needs our help. We're a collective. We're working for each other. And it it dramatically changes the energy in the food when there is that fear and insecurity. But it also has helped countless thousands of people that have been through my educational program have a much more holistic spiritual relationship with food. Steiner teaches in his teachings that when a plant expresses its pain, it expresses it in the astral realm. That's why most people here are unaware of it. Mm. And what you were describing to me is that you're tapped into the astral level as well as this 3D mm. level, which is why you're picking up the messages there. Mm. And, and I easily tap into those realms as well. But uh, I think if people understood that we're not, we're really only killing food if we're abusing it and we're living a life 
that's destructive and not fulfilling to ourselves or the people that we're in relationship with. And we're not taking responsibility for what we're creating each day. Then, then we're on a, a, a journey that always leads to pain. And I call that inviting the pain teacher. And when the pain teacher comes, it's to quicken consciousness and give you the opening to come back into alignment with the higher truth of yourself. Um, I'd like to dive deeper into your teachings on the black hole principle and your cosmology. Can we explore the following concepts together so the listeners and I can hear your perspective on, and there's a bunch of them here, so I'll, I'll read about so the listeners know where we're going, but feel free to go one at a time or however it suits you. What do you feel consciousness is and how does it function in your model? How does consciousness relate to source intelligence or what we commonly refer to as God? And is there anything prior to consciousness in your creation myth model or theory? Mm. Um, I think we've, d- we've touched on it a, a bit in, in simplistic terms about it being the ground of all being and um, the center of the black hole. I'm sure most of you are aware, even though you may not like the taste of organs, that organ meats are extremely important and good for you. And I've got great news for you. Paleo Valley makes an amazing grass-fed organ complex that's unique and better than anything I've ever found out there. So much better. I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith, its creator, exactly what you're going to get from their grass-fed organ complex. Autumn, get us informed on why we should be using your amazing organ complex. Okay. Well, like you said, organ meats are nature's multivitamins. And when we use them, we feel this energy and this stamina. And most people don't like the flavor. So what we did was we took grass-fed and finished organs like liver and heart and kidney, and we just put them into capsules so that you can get all the benefits, the beautiful benefits of organ meats without actually having to taste them, without liver burps, of course. And they're just freeze-dried. So again, they're not processed heavily in any way whatsoever, and they are sourced from American farmers using regenerative agricultural practices. And all you have to do to try it out is go to our website at paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, and that's lowercase c-h-e-k-15. And I sincerely hope you love it. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wade, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combined them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy by Optimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it? And what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Shervin Jaffaria, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to Symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Shilaj minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their biocharge activated coconut charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. 
Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis liposomal glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. Well, Manjir, I, I really uh, love everything that you're sharing, and I'm so grateful that you're one of the few medical doctors that has made the transition from the molecule into consciousness and all that entails, which is everything we're talking about. Fortunately, there are a number of medical doctors out there that are moving in that direction. My program is multidisciplinary. I have over 15,000 students worldwide, and a lot of them are medical doctors and nurses and people in the healthcare field. So uh, there are a lot of people waking up to that, thank God. And we need it, as you know, now. I'd like to dive deeper in your teachings on the black hole principle, your cosmology. Uh, Can we explore the following concepts together so the listeners and I can hear your perspective on consciousness, what you feel it is, and how does it function in your model? Now, we did talk about that a little bit. If you want to show us how it incorporates into your model, that would be great. How does consciousness correlate to source intelligence or God in your model? And is there anything prior to consciousness or creation in your myth model or theory? I think uh, those are great questions. And I think we've got to start, though, when we talk about black holes, uh, where people will be most familiar with black holes. Because most people think, because it's the orthodox physics um, concept that black holes are these great guzzling monsters that they're lurking in space and they're you know we see them in sci-fi movies um, that they're these places of infinite density and infinite gravity so if you go past the event horizon then you're gone you know and there's all sorts of exciting speculations as to what happens to you when you get (laughs) get past that event horizon um and it's a concept that came out of einstein's theories you know if you bend space and time so much that um you know and the idea that if a star gets over a certain um certain size and it collapses in on itself that it collapses into this infinite density and infinite gravity. So this was where we were in the early 20th century. And um, somebody, I think it was John Wheeler, called uh, used it as a joke term, uh, you know, black hole, and it just kind of stuck. Um, so that's what most people think of when they think of black holes. Um, now, as I said, before there was a theoretical concept and we weren't sure that we were ever going to find these objects in space. But as we started to explore space with these telescopes, these powerful telescopes, um, we started finding black holes all over the place. So you might be wondering, especially at the centre of every galaxy, you might be wondering, well, how can you find a black hole? Because um, n- nothing or even light can escape a black hole, supposedly. Um, well, they realized that there were black holes in the center of galaxies because the stars at the centers of galaxies were moving so fast that they thought the only thing that has that sort of gravitational effect is a black hole. So really, at the start of the 21st century, we moved into an era where we realized that black holes are actually very much present in our world. They're at the center of each, gra- uh, each uh, galaxy. And um, so, you know, we started to explore more and more into space. Now, when I came came into the picture, um, as you'll, you've probably read in the Genius Group, an extraordinary amount of events happened in my personal life, which meant that I had the time to kind of contemplate this stuff. I'd always been interested in science, cosmology, physics. And uh, so I was looking up the um looking at the whole concept that 
there were things coming out out of black holes. So the, instead of black holes being, you know, completely black, instead our observations were showing that um, there were actually gamma rays that were coming out of black holes, um, electrons at uh, just about the speed of light, and positrons. So this was an article in uh, New Scientist called uh, The Great Annihilators. And the reason why it's The Great Annihilators is when uh, positrons and electrons come together, they make a particle of light um, called the gamma ray. Okay, so uh, so we'll 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 say that they make the we'll put it together like that. It's you know <laughs> it's a simple version. So if you can imagine, an electron is a particle of matter, and it has a negative charge, and a positron is a particle of antimatter. So it's 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 um it's mirror image. And mm-hmm. when they come together, they go poof, and they become light. Right. Um, so that's the signature that we were seeing coming out of black holes. And people were wondering why. So, and not only were they seeing them coming out of big black holes, but also medium-sized black holes as well. And I was contemplating this uh, back in 2003, and I knew that there was something there. I knew that there was that there was something that we hadn't quite uncovered. And I was out walking. You were talking about the trees and the communication, and I was out walking in the woods with my dog, and uh, I sat on the branch of an oak tree, and then suddenly I was actually in it. I, I could sort of I was experiencing it it wasn't just a vision I was actually in consciousness itself and I believe that all scientific revelations actually happen like this if you look at the actual description you know it's an actual kind of revelation and I realize that we've got it wrong black holes are not the destroyers they're actually the creators so what's happening is that you know we're talking about the light of consciousness in the center of every black hole, that infinity, which before we saw as the singularity that was sucking everything in, is actually that infinite light of consciousness at the center of the black hole. And what happens is that light, and I say moves, but again, we're not talking about movement because we're beyond space and time here, but we have to use language that um, gives us uh, you know, an understanding. So I'm going to talk about light moving in higher dimensions, but it's not really the case. But let's talk about light moving. So it moves from the infinity at the center through the dimensions, gets to the edge of our reality, which is what we call the speed of light. And that particle of light splits into matter and antimatter. And that's why we see electrons coming out of black holes at just below the speed of light, because they've only just slowed down to our dimension. So that's where the X-rays and everything that we see coming out caused by these high, high, uh, fast moving electrons. But it also breathes and it goes the other way. This is where we get the sort of, um, the, uh, the movement of the Dao, the breath of the Dao, the dance of the, mm-hmm. the dance of Shiva, everything like that. So it moves the other way. Everything in the universe is breathing, breathing and spinning. And so you end yeah. up with, um, these particles, the matter and the antimatter coming back again together and causing the, uh, gamma ray to be created. That's why we get these intermittent bursts of X-rays, gamma rays, because of this breath happening. And um, then I, when I was out in the woods, I suddenly got this uncontrollable desire to go to sleep. It was in the middle of the afternoon, and I suddenly I had to go to sleep. So I went to sleep, and I for about an hour. And when I woke up, I realized that I had been dreaming the same process at the atom level. You know, this breathing process and that what Paul Dirac realized that there was this positron and electron um, kind of process going on at the atomic level was correct. But he just the models are just, um, you know, we, we look at it slightly differently. But I realized that this same process is happening at the atomic level. We call the sort of breathing process quantum leaps um, and uh, and it's happening at the galactic level. Those are the two bits that I, I needed, and I realized it was going throughout the whole universe. So yes. we see this as a, 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 a level of a star. We see these 
intermittent ejections. We call them coronal mass ejections when it comes to our own sun. Um, we see this at the level of um, planets. We see that at the level of quarks. We see, we even see these, you know, these. We see they're often as bipolar jets, like these two jets at um, one eighty degrees from each other around uh, around yeah. objects, even in small um, planets, everything. And uh, so we're seeing this at every single level level of the universe. It's intermittent. It's much more powerful than we would expect. Um, because it's being powered by infinity. Right. It's been not being powered by the physical universe. It's being powered by the black hole itself, the infinity, the infinite light that's coming through the black hole. And uh, so basically um, that's, that's the force of creation. That's how the consciousness that we've been talking about manifests itself below the spirit, speed of light into what we would call physical reality. So I have spent now, since 2003, so many years uh, researching this, um, you know, checking that this is true, check it, a, a good theory in, in science, a good theory in physics um, makes predictions that come true. So from this simple pattern, we can predict things, we can go, you know what? We expect to see this at every single level. We expect intermittent gamma rays. We expect intermittent electrons and positrons to be coming out. Where's one of the places where we see the black hole principle in action quite a lot? Our own planet, our weather systems. Let's take thunderstorms, for example. In thunderstorms, just as late as the 1990s, we started to realize that there are gamma ray bursts in thunderstorms. So what are thunderstorms? They are mini black holes. This idea that you have friction building up in clouds that suddenly discharge static electricity, well, guess what doesn't fit with that? The science. You know, when you actually yeah, um, funny when, that. <laughs> no, when you actually measure it, there's not nearly enough static that, to produce this, uh, a bolt of lightning. So what, what's the bolt of lightning? Fast moving electrons. So I predicted in the book that was published, Punk Science, in um, when 2006, I wrote it in 2005, but, um, you know, that we would find antimatter in thunderstorms and NASA found antimatter in thunderstorms in 2011 um found gamma ray bursts in hurricanes um found uh you know so we're seeing all of these uh predictions once you know the simple pattern you can predict a lot of stuff lightning mm -hmm. coming out of volcanoes volcanoes what are they seismologists don't fully know you know right. geologists don't fully know what these things are you know so you're seeing earthquakes okay you know and the other thing that we're seeing what what comes out of um what comes out of thunderstorms? Water, rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so water comes out of uh, thunderstorms. So, you know, back then I thought, God, if I really say that black holes produce water, people think, really think I'm nuts. People think I'm nuts anyway, I suppose. But, you know, um, but what do we find now? All over space, we're finding huge pools of water um, coming out of black holes. Real galactic black holes are giving off jets of water and um so and then we're looking on different planets the moon jupiter i predicted that we'll find you're likely to find water places because it's coming from the core of the planets so mm -hmm. even on our planet um we now realize that there are oceans of water close to the core of the earth that are tied in with crystals sometimes um but it's it's not from some asteroid that has dropped you know, years ago, and then we just have the water cycle going. It's been produced by the core of the Earth itself. And so we're seeing this on Enceladus, on these jet, intermittent jets of water, as this breathing black hole principle occurs at every single level of the universe. So um, that's the, you know, realization. And even since the book got published, um, there's just so much more uh, research that I've done. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the production of water, even, I know this is going to be a radical one, but the production of what we call fossil fuels, um, right. I think is a black hole principle. Um, uh, I don't know if you want me to go on about that. But, well, yeah, you know. yeah. Share, share whatever, whatever's in your heart. 
<laughs> well, one of the things that I realized, I was actually watching a documentary about the Gulf of Mexico, and it was talking about the um, supposed asteroid crater that, um, that that wiped out, the supposedly wiped out the dinosaurs. And, you know, funny about these asteroid craters, it doesn't leave any trace of the asteroid. It both impacts plus evaporates. Uh, very odd. I mean, in nature, you definitely see something. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, so it mentioned that, that the edge of the crater was material from the interior of the Earth. And I thought, that's not an impact. That's coming up. Mm -hmm. That's not coming down. That's coming up. And I thought, that sounds to me like it's a massive black hole ejection from the, in the past from the central black hole of the Earth that has given off... Um, this material that is found at the edge of the crater. And I thought, if that's the case, then what about all the oil that is found in the Gulf of Mexico? And I thought, could it be that this oil is actually coming upwards rather than going downwards? And I thought, if I'm right, then we should be able to see oil in space. Because if this really is a black hole principles process, we should be able to find what we call fossil fuels that, you know, by the way, there's no, you know, definite, definitive evidence for how we, you know, trees and plankton become what we call fossil fuels. Um, and uh, it's just a hypothesis that's never been fully proved. Um, but anyway, so I went and had a look and sure enough, crude oil found on Mars um, you know, there, there are moons out there in the solar system, absolutely full of oil. There's large oil fields in deep into space. If oil is the result of ancient sea creatures, what the heck is it doing in space? What are right. all the organics yeah. doing in space? And, uh, so, you know, then <laughs> remarkable things like coal being ejected. A professor in Hong Kong has found coal being ejected by stars. Stars that actually eject water. I mean, amazing to think that you're getting water coming from stars. But if you Google stars, um, eject water bullets, you will find the story. Um, so, you know, the, the mainstream scientists don't know what's going on, but when you know that there's a simple pattern causing methane plumes on Mars, you know, why is it that the Mars rover is finding methane plumes that are going, you know, at some times of the day and not, not at other times? Why plumes? Why intermittent? Well, because when you understand that there's this black hole principle as an intermittent creative principle, then you understand that this breathing process makes that intermittent, these intermittent jets. So I believe that the black hole principle is creating what we call organic chemicals all over space. And um, so it's creating these jets of water, it's creating this coal that we're seeing coming out of stars. It's uh, creating the oil fields that we see on Titan. It's creating these organics that we're finding all over asteroids. Um, you know, and it created the so-called fossil fuels in our own planet. This has obviously got massive implications for climate change, how we understand climate change. If we understand that a hurricane is a mini black hole that produces water, lightning, gamma ray bursts, all the things that you'd expect, and is, uh, and is spinning. Recently, they found these space hurricanes. Did you hear about that giving off? Mm, I haven't heard that specifically, no, but there is something I want to share with you when you have a moment. <laughs> but, uh, you know, th so that um, space hurricane that's giving off electrons, the aurora borealis and australis, you know, the, the northern lights, southern lights, you know, they, this, th that's the bipolar jet of our own planet. You know, producing charged particles. We're told that, oh, this is an interaction with with the sun and everything, but you're getting them go both going at once. So um, basically, it's the same simple pattern, the black hole principle, just, um, just basically expressing itself at different levels. And once you know the simple principle, it becomes so easy to make predictions. You can predict the weather on Jupiter. You can predict that Mars has water. You can predict cryovolcanoes on Pluto, you know, which they just found recently. You know, why does Pluto have these volca volcanic eruptions with, you know, when it's supposed to be so icy? Because the volcanoes are part of the intermittent eruptions coming from the central black hole of Pluto.
you know, the core of the planet is a black hole dynamo and it's producing these um these eruptions. So yeah, it, once you understand this, you can understand um, you know, the the patterns of the universe. And I think when we understand climate change, we have to talk about pan planetary climate. You know, we have to understand mm -hmm. climate on on planets in general. And right. uh, that will help us to understand the climate change of our own planet. Yeah, a couple of things. One, David Wilcock has shown evidence from NASA that every single planet in our planetary chain is heating up. It's not just the Earth. They're all warming up. And he actually showed NASA thermographic images from space probes uh, objectifying that. The other thing is, I was recently watching a documentary, and it, I'm pretty sure it was Nassim Harriman. If not, it was uh, Greg Braden. But they showed how one of the cosmologists or astronomers was curious as to how much water there might be in space. So he got the frequency of water and tuned one of their super telescopes to exactly that frequency. And the images that came back were quite stunning. They showed water everywhere as far as that telescope could see. And the water gl uh, glowed on the images as blue. And it, there was just literally water dispersed between the stars ubiquitously. Like somebody had taken a giant spray gun and just filled space with water. The other thing, I had an image come to me when you started describing the black hole principle and you were talking about everything spinning. and the the thought that came to my head is that the universe is a whirling dervish <laughs> a la rumi so that's that's very interesting so how do you define spirit and soul in your model and are spirit and soul related to consciousness on the grand or individual scale well the center of every single black hole is the same it's the same infinity, expressing itself in infinite different levels. So you've got this simple pattern that is expressing itself at different levels through geometry. And I know some of the people you've just mentioned talk about geometry. That's the yeah. other side. I think um, we all have a piece of the puzzle. And yeah. uh, my piece is to talk about the particle physics, talk about the actual data and evidence we get from the telescopes. And, you know, at the moment, the astrophysicists don't understand why we see this here. We see this fast radio burst here. We see microwaves here. We, You know, what's going on? And once you understand that underlying pattern, it all becomes simple. When mm -hmm. you go beyond the speed of light, that's where the geometries come in. And I know in my pathway, um, I'm not here to talk about that, but there are other people who are, and that's absolutely fine. We all have the pieces of puzzles. And um, so the the way that we're all connected is with the same infinity at the heart of every single black hole. So in us as well, you know, the traditional chakras um, are spinning vortices with some people see them as two jets, you know, mm -hmm. the same pattern. And what do the chakras do? Create the body. So the black mm -hmm. hole principle is about the process of creation, infinite creation at every single level. And, you know, it's not uh, this, I don't know if you know this, but there's a whole movement in main, in, in cosmology. It's not in the new age or anything about the big bang, um, didn't happen. That there's so much evidence that, um, you know, just goes against the big bang. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm very familiar with that. I studied a lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because there's just so much inconsistencies with that model. And not only that, it puts science on the same footage as religion because they have nothing to say about what came before the so-called big bang. Like how yes. do you get a big bang to happen without some kind of causative agent? In other words, there, you, you know, something has to light the fire metaphorically. So the idea of the big bang become being the original cause is, is, um, well, it, it's not even mythical. It's nonsensical. Uh, really, I, I saw a, a lecture with Neil Turok from 
Cambridge, he was he's now at the Perimeter Institute, and he put up a slide. He was talking about his um, brain theory, uh, B-R-A-N-E, and he put a little hand saying, we don't know what got all this. And he said, uh, you know, hand of God is the good of... <laughs> and, again, yeah. you know, and this is in a physics conference. Sorry. And <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's amazing. But, you know, so we're going away from this big bang that everything started at one point in time and going to this... Um, you know, this continuous fractal, creation continuous model. Continuous creation model, exactly. And so this fractal creation and continuous creation model. And so, you know, you in your own self, your atoms, your chakras, everything, your quarks, you're, you're expressing and bringing in from infinity at every single point. Um, so there is no set point. There is no place where you can, um, stop the each of the vortices in the uh, of um of reality and say oh that's that vortex so, you know it, it it's not just the main chakras it's just going throughout right. all of you that brings a question some of the experts that i've studied out there are suggesting that there are black holes even in the center of what we call an atom what's your scalability in your model Yes, yeah. The um, I mean, I looked at the work of people like Jean Chiron and uh, you know the uh, the uh, Stranger Within, you know, and he was talking about. I, I have a question for you about his concept. I don't want to interrupt you, but if if uh, let me know when you're ready. Uh, no, go go ahead. <laughs> First of all, I think his works are very good. Um. What's your thoughts on his concept of the electron recording everything and having a spiritual dimension, which he calls hyperspace, and the electron is the medium of spirit, which is the basically the flow of energy and information that is recording what's happening in our physical experience and bringing it up into the what he refers to as hyperdimensional space and sharing that because his electron theory of consciousness and spirit is very, very similar to F Fred Hoyle's theory of the universe in a constant feedback loop with itself and that each of us are really conscious agents. In other words, we are the, ex we are the eyes, the ears, and the senses of the universe looking at and experiencing itself. So if you take Fred Hoyle's you, you know, I'm sure you've seen his diagram of a you with two faces looking at each other. And then you've got Charon's model of the electron as the transfer of energy and information, which becomes conscious information. You kind of have two separate scientists coming from different perspectives, but saying almost supporting each other, one at the micro level and one at the macro level. It becomes simple when you understand that everything is is consciousness. So the yes. electron has consciousness, um, Mars has consciousness, you know, and you're talking about it's p p the things that Jean Charon were talking about giving the electron the um, spiritual aspect. Um, yes. it's it's really at, at every single level because that's the fundamental and that's what's coming through. So he had some very um ideas really ahead of his time, but it's oh, yeah. it's like going forward um we can now apply this and see that this is at every single level. And now we have what we didn't have in those days, which is the astrophysics data. And right. you know, you're talking to you it got me back looking at Bentoff and um you know Yay. so <laughs> and see one of my that, spirit guides <laughs> and see that he had this i mean wow was he ahead of his time um oh, he yes. has this very very fuzzy picture of a quasar with a jet and i mean he just knew i i, I just looking at this he just knew intuitively there was something there and that this jet was significant um because of course well he um, was a remote viewer he was looking at yeah, it yeah i don't know if you know the story but one of his friends worked for NASA and came to him one day and said, we're trying to figure out what the rings of Saturn are made of. He said, I can tell you that they're chunks of ice. And he said to, to Bentov, how do you know that? He said, I'm a remote viewer. I can go anywhere and look at it. And about two or three years later, when the first photos from the space probe came back, he brought them to Bentov. And before that, he went back to NASA and said, well, my friend Itzhak Bentov says, this is what the rings of Saturn are made of. And they just laughed at him. But when the space probe came back, they couldn't deny that it was exactly 
what he had told them. And uh, a little story for you, you know, I began, long story made short, but my soul guided me to being a vegetarian for a year and took me through a series of processes, but my soul asked me to do Egyptian sun gazing for an hour each morning and an hour each night during this entire year. And a lot of things happened to me, which I won't take the time to tell, but one of the things that happened was this being kept coming to me and talking to me. And I wrote a whole book, which I haven't published, but I wrote a 273 page book of my conversations. And I said to him, what is your name? He said, my name is Gobbit. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, I am an expression of God, but I manifest like a hobbit. He says, I manifest in dimensions where people are lost, scared, and confused. But he says, I take on the kind of the dress and the appearance of a bum, and the people interact with me very negatively, which gives me a chance to engage them. And he says, I awaken them by saying what they need to know at that time to be shifted into higher consciousness. And it was driving me crazy because I kept thinking, I know this person. I know this person. And I had read Stalking the Wild Pendulum probably five years before this, and I happened to be drawn back to it, and I opened the cover and uh, the back cover and saw a picture of Itzhak Bentov, and I went, oh my God, it's him. And so I drew his picture on a piece of paper, and at that time, one of my patients from Canada is a guy that owns a company that uses 3D printers to make floats for the Super Bowl and the Rose parades and all this stuff. And we were having a conversation about this kind of stuff. And I was telling him some of the stuff. And he said, well, what does he look like? And I said, I'll show you. And I went and got this piece of paper that I'd drawn Gobbit's picture on. He said, can I have a photocopy of that? I want to send you a gift. He took it home. He had his sculptors make it into a 3D sculpture. And he sent me the sculpture back and I've got it sitting on my stereo right here in my office. Oh, amazing. And sometimes I show my students this sculpture and then on, I, I have a picture of all the key teachers that I love and I b- do a prayer and say thank you to them and blow smoke to them. And one of them is Itzhak Bentov. And so I show my students the picture of Bentov and the sculpture and they're like, oh my God, it's exactly the same guy. Yeah, so okay. it was funny because Bentov started coming to me through my sun gazing practice mm. because I was in a perfect state to receive him and channeled a 273 page book through me. Oh, he, he was, yeah, there's certain people that come to the planet and they are, they just see things and they are just so ahead of the time. Walter Russell. Uh, yes, I've studied yeah. him extensively. <laughs> I did his entire home study course, his one year course. Mm-hmm. And I've read all of his books and I, I love Walter Russell. And I'm actually friends with the guy who's in charge of distributing his material in the United States, which for those of you interested is Joey Korn. And if you go to dowsers.com, you can find all of Walter Russell's mind blowing works there. Well, you'll, you'll know from having read, um, read his work then that, um, that what he was bringing through was totally in line with Black Hole Principle. Yes, the infin- infinite light. Yeah, except way, way beyond, actually, Walter Russell. But, I mean, yeah. um, what? Uh, so what, I've, what I'm doing is um, looking at the data that we've got now through being in a space age um, and uh, in the telescope age and being able to get the actual <laughs> observations. And, uh, you know, and you know, realizing that this is in line with this black hole principle, which is, you know, what Walter Russell and, and people have been bringing through, but they didn't have the advantage of the actual data. Right. Um, so we now have the astrophysics data to start to piece together what these people who are so far seeing, um, you know, and uh, realizing that they were right. You know, <laughs> um, you may have to realize that the language is slightly different and, you know, with people like Bentoff and Russell, they're going deep into 
areas of the universe that we will never have measurements from um with in terms of physical measurements yes you know and that's okay we we need but when it comes to the below the speed of light and what's happening there we can measure things and when we see that we see this pattern going throughout the whole of reality um so yeah amazing amazing stuff and uh, you know he was getting on to something when he's talking about the black hole white hole um, aspect he kind of knew that there was something about black holes that was creative um, but yes. he just he just didn't have the information bent over that point you know he didn't have that um he didn't have the data so now well, he we- did i was just going to say he did clearly say that black holes are connected to white holes which give birth to new stars and and that the black hole is not just an eating machine, it's also equally productive. So right there, you can see the complementary opposites yes. of yin and yang working yes. together to create life. Uh, yes. And also Stephen Hawking at one point said, the only two things that can escape a black hole are energy and information, which in my definition, that's what spirit is, the flow of energy and information. And soul is that which is experiencing the energy and information as life. So a, a simple description I give is soul is what's having the experience and spirit's, spirit is the experience it's having. Well, if you look at Hawking radiation, he said quite clearly that they at the edge of a, I mean, he puts it in terms of at the edge of the event horizon. You have the photon splitting into the electron and positron and one falls in and one falls out. And then, you know, so he knew that there was something. So um, what we're seeing with the electrons are going, you know, almost at the speed of light coming from black, they're actually coming from the black holes themselves. And that's mm-hmm. what the astrophysicists can't face at the moment. Right. That it's the black holes that were actually created, not the stuff falling in that gets superheated and because that makes no sense and i've been in a physics conference where um they're actually trying to do the mathematical um you know contortions to try and make that fit from the so-called accretion disk which we now can re um rename the creation disk um it's not stuff going down the plug hole that gets superheated and gives off this jet it's the black hole itself that is giving off the jets from infinity and over time these spin um so we see that in our own milky way we see these two jets then circumscribe these bubbles and the astrophysicists are sitting around going where are these bubbles coming from where are these bubbles from the black hole itself it's giving off the jets but you can only understand that if you understand that the below the speed of light world which like you're saying earlier, is the mental world, um, is not the only realm. And, you know, when we talk, go back to the mythical era, people then understood that, that we were yes. in this multidimensional reality. We've lost sight of that. Hence, the physics is no longer making sense. Why do we have these fast radio bursts that give energy of entire, you know, solar systems in, you know, a few sections of a second? You know, because yes. it's coming through the infinity. So, you know, radio waves, microwaves, the whole microwave background, um, when they actually went and checked it, they realized that it's correlating with current structures when it's supposed to be a remnant of a Big Bang that happened 15 billion years ago. Doesn't make sense. But what do we mm. see coming out of black holes? Microwaves. So, you know, when you realize that the current black hole principle process is producing these microbes, hence there are alignments that are happening, uh, correlating with current structures, then it starts to make sense of a lot of the things that, um, uh, you know, don't make sense before. So, you know, now that we've got this astrophysics data, we can look back to these people like Bentoff and realize, my goodness, you know, it's so, so far ahead of his time. And, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, I make, it makes sense of all this. So, yeah, it, it is the, um, it's the, it takes the realization that we are not just in a 3D world. Um, that there is, that's why I call it the perception horizon because, um, there's a lot that's beyond our perception. So I've renamed the speed of light the perception horizon. So that's the limitation. Mm, I like that. Of our normal 3D perception. But that's, we have mistaken as a limitation of our universe. It's not. 
you know, which is why 99.9% of the universe is unknown to us. It's the dark energy and the dark matter. You know, uh, the, the what we see as physical is 0.3% of the universe. You know, so all of the galaxies and stars, everything, this vast thing that we think is around us is still only a tiny fraction of what the universe yes. is. So unless you understand we are embedded in many, many higher dimensions and some of those are beyond the speed of light, beyond normal perception, the universe doesn't make any sense. So when impulses come from these infinite dimensions in through and into our dimension they slow down you know that's why we see these sudden fast bursts that contain all this you know amazing energy that doesn't make sense from a 3d perspective they're not explosions they they sometimes repeat themselves because what what do we do when we see something we go oh, it was a star exploding then 50 years later we see more, you know, more bursts coming from that part of space. And we go, well, hang on a minute, that, that star, star exploded 50 years ago. What's going on? It's not a star exploding. It's this breathing pattern, you know, that that occurs over time. And so if you train your telescope on that same area, over time you will see emissions coming from there because of the breathing. Mm -hmm. And, yes, it's very powerful, because the universe is effortlessly powerful and it yes. doesn't it doesn't infinitely have, powerful infinitely <laughs> and it's effortless it doesn't have to explode to express that power it's coming in from other realms beyond the perception horizon yeah a couple of things that come to my mind i've shared this on a previous podcast with walt thornhill but i don't know if you're aware of this but in his teachings there's a point i can't remember exactly which book i have about 180 books attributed to rudolf steiner wow. and uh in one of them he speaks about how and i think this is the early 1900s he was saying that the conception of stars that science has is wrong he said if you could actually see inside of a star it would be a uh, he he described it as a giant spherical mirror and you would be standing inside of a huge empty space full of light. And he said it would be more like you were inside of a spherical mirror, which mm -hmm. I thought was a very interesting conception yeah, on yeah. many levels. But if you think if, if there is an infinite power source producing light inside of a spherical mirror, then that light would be bouncing around back and forth and radiating in every direction like a star. Yeah, I think he was going into the beyond the um beyond the perception horizon aspects. So that's yes. where you see the real, you know, um the other essence. dimensional yeah, the real essence. So I mean, yeah. I know my my partner James has seen um the scent of the soul as a mirror I've seen the collective um, humanity as um, as uh, what I call the God blob, um, yeah. which is like a silver kind of blob, you know, coming. So this this motif seems to go throughout a lot of uh, reality. But again, stars express when I, I'm really looking at the interface um, between the other realms and what we call this realm, 3D realm, because that's where we can measure. That's where we have the data. So when we see, um, the stars, um, you know, they are ejecting through the, through things like sunspots. Uh, well, when we examine our own sun, we can see these intermittent ejections. And what do we see? Matter, antimatter, spiraling, all of these things. Um, and we see water coming out of sunspots. I yes. mean, doesn't that blow your mind that water's actually been ejected from stars? And, um, you know, so we're, we're seeing the same pattern happening at every single level of reality. And, you know, Steiner, um, just a few years ago, we realized we got the chemical composition of the sun completely wrong. And, uh, you know, and people were saying, well, we have to throw everything out. You know, we don't really understand what the sun is. Now, that is something that quietly went away. <laughs> you know, people, uh, of course. <laughs> 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 people don't talk about it much, but, you know, <laughs> uh, but, you know, everything, you see the same sort of pattern of radioactivity, 
Um, that's another aspect of the black hole principle. The um, you know, particles that are coming off the sun. It's it's the same pattern at every single level. So yeah, he is going into the beyond. The like you say, the essence. Um, so what I'm saying with the black hole principle is it is what we can measure, what the actual data says, which is at a level sort of chunking down from that as we come from the higher dimensions to um to what we call 3d reality below the speed of light so okay. that's yeah yeah I mean, even though i've got mystical even though i myself have mystical abilities that's what i'm focused on yeah well i love it uh <laughs> you know i've got a great book by michael talbot that shows the correlations between all the things mystics identified and then mostly quantum physicists came to identify and showed beyond a shadow of a doubt. They were seeing the same things, just using different words to describe them. Yes. Great, great books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then are you familiar with William A. Tiller's book, science and human transformation? Um, I'm, I'm just, he's one of the people I'm just so honored to have met in person and spent time with and, can call a friend you know and yeah um, you know so definitely one of my um huge inspirations and someone who doesn't get a lot of um credit for what he's done credit is also someone called john maleski um based out of albuquerque and he looked at tiller's work and he um realized that uh one of the conclusions was that um black holes are a source of super light Oh yeah, and um, so you know, and that he looked at the equations that Tiller had um, had uh, worked with. Uh, you know, Tiller worked with Maxwell's equations, and um, so he was one of my inspirations as well. That uh, John Molesky, and uh, so yeah, definitely familiar with uh, with um, William Tiller's work. The reason I was bringing it up is because. In Science and Human Transformation, he gives the math to show that the speed of light in each chakra goes up significantly from the root to the crown, and ultimately each of those chakras is accessing another dimension hmm. of reality, all of which are basically brought into us so that we can be part of the whole. And I think conscious growth is really, you could just say, learning to actually perceive at the level that each of our chakras is at and a kundalini rising is guess what this is what it looks like when they're all connected you're fully tapped into reality now you know but so many people that i've spoken to say oh the guy's an idiot nothing moves faster than the speed of light i'm like First of all, how can you say that the guy's an idiot if you haven't even looked at his books and studied it? And second of all, are you even good enough at math to follow his equations? And third of all, do you realize he's a highly celebrated uh, scientist, mathematician, professor, and he's not an idiot? So pull your head out of your fourth point of contact and quit being so disrespectful. Um, unfortunately, I find the people that are the least educated are the most judgmental, which is sad, and usually the most sure of themselves. Uh, one of the things too, there's two things I want to bring up while I, because I, I would love to ask your opinion on this, you know, looking at people like Paul Dirac, he did calculations on what the total mass of the universe. And he looked at, I think, was it positrons? It was matter and antimatter or po po positron electron pairs. And he said that the total mass of the universe was zero, which is beautiful. Um, but others have done this, and and I've studied at least three biographies on Richard Feynman, and one of the things that Feynman says is in his math, infinities kept popping up, but in order to make it work in the three-dimensional reality, they had to keep using renormalization, or the math wouldn't work out, and he said he hated doing it because he called it cheesy math. Um. What I wanted to ask you is, do you know what exactly renormalization is? How are they taking an infinity and turning it into a number so it fits their framework? I did read that uh, in uh, Feynman's work, you know, biographies and stuff like that before. I can't remember all the details, but, you know, it's true about the infinities because, um, you know, when you, the answer is infinity. 
and they don't want to face up to that because of course it doesn't yes. work in equations. It's like everyone's looking for a um idea of everything. It's infinity. You know, so because the infinity is at the center of all the black holes. And um I was at a physics conference uh when uh someone was talking about Heisenberg and uh saying that he you know, some of the calculations he was doing showed that the quantum field was actually um, a sea of black holes with infinity at the centre. And that he was doing in the 1930s. So it's like, oh, my goodness. I've read that myself. Yeah. Um, there's a book that I wonder if you're familiar with. If you're not, it's worth getting because it supports your model on many levels. It's called Infinity and the Mind by a mathematician named Rudy Rucker from California here. Are you familiar with that book? You you did uh, just message me last week. Yeah, so I've been looking to it. I haven't got hold of it yet. Yeah, I've, I've just finished my studies of it. And the whole way through, I'm going, man, Manjir has to read this book if she's not read this because this is just – great support for her model um the other thing is could you for everybody listening define what a dimension is because people talk about dimensions and there's so many different dimensional models many of which do not match at all so when you're using the term or when scientists use the term like a dimension shift or multi-dimensions what exactly is a dimension in this concept, either how you use it or how science is using it? Mm, yeah, it's it's an interesting one that. Um, I mean, first of all, I'd like to say that um, in terms of support uh, for the model, um, there's so much um, support now. One of them is that the predictive value that you can actually predict. Like, um, I'm probably the only person in the world that would have predicted that hurricanes produce gamma ray bursts. Um, so, and antimatter, you know, so that's another type of support that we actually have the data. Um, but in terms of dimensions, it's a really, really good question. Um, so, you know, in the in terms of the physics, you know, you talk about, uh, we talk about dimensions, like the three dimensions of space that you can go up and down, side by to side and you know um and uh, back and forth and things and uh, then you've got the dimension of time which is sometimes seen as the fourth dimension um so and then string theory goes into all these different dimensions um where you have although we can't sort of perceive of them you know you have a uh, different dimensions um of uh, you know 11 dimensions right and these are kind of like seen as almost like hypothetical spatial dimensions, I guess, and right. um, that they're all sort of enfolded. Um, so um, there's that sort of science level of dimensions. And then there's the experience that people yes. have. And the experience from really you don't need any equipment other than the human being, you know, right. <laughs> you can go and uh, through, you know, probably getting centred, but... Um, people have them in all sorts of conditions where you can experience something other than that you know is not three-dimensional reality. So that's where, because consciousness is fundamental, it's able to access beyond the perception horizon. Um, although we can't measure beyond the, the speed of light, beyond the perception horizon, our consciousness itself can um, can perceive beyond there. Um, and that's what we call mysticism. Um, so yes. that's another kind of way of looking at dimensions. And um, yes, they are sometimes used interchangeably, which might um, annoy physicists because they have their definitions. And uh, but I think the you know real lived experience of a lot of people throughout the ages, uh, shamans and all sorts of people, is that there are different dimensions of consciousness. And yes. In those dimensions of consciousness, um, you know, you have the possibility of um, beings there too. So those are the spirit guides, the angels. And let's not forget that in our society, as we're, we're coming all the way around to how did we get here, um, you know, there is a hidden hand, and that hidden hand 
it resides in these con- these realms of consciousness that people often mm-hmm. are, aren't aware of. And they go to great lengths to make sure that people are as shut down as possible. So, and all of these ideas are poo pooed so that, you know, the reality of what's going on is not available to a lot, lot of people. Even though Why they, do you think they do that? What's their motive for that? Well, control, you know, yeah. so if you keep, keep people, um, you Dumb. know, poo- <laughs> yeah, poo pooing their multidimensional abilities. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the beautiful thing about, say, the Gnostic Gospels is the Gnostic, Gnostic Gospel creation myth is that, um, when the goddess Sophia fell from higher dimensions and, um, you know, was uh, involved in creating like a, uh, a mistake of some sort and that mistake created human beings and um she and her sometimes it's the mother put the divine spark in human beings so that no matter what happens they always have a hotline to the divine so what, what in this conversation we would say to that infinite one consciousness they right. always have a hotline to that and um i think there's so much that is trying to obscure that in our lives that we yes. are connected. We are always connected. And, you know, from distractions with TV, sports, whatever it is, you know, but ultimately nothing can take that away from us. We are, we are connected to the, to the oneness, um, at all times. And we have the ability to, um, to have multidimensional experiences. So that's the other aspect that we're talking about, the, um, the experience dimensions. But you're right, it's clumsily equated. And, um, you know, so which would annoy very much the physicists and, um, you know, who, who say, you know, this, this term is just banding about all the time. And, um, I think there are infinite dimensions ultimately. When you are really in a multidimensional experience, you realize just how we don't have the language to really describe this. You know, we, we have to talk in linear terms. So for us, when we just think of dimensions in a 3D way, we go, well, it's like layers and layers of an onion or something. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how we have to picture it. But the reality is different. It's not um linear. It's not as um simple. And but you know, we have to use those terms for our, you know, below the speed of light self <laughs> to understand it and that's fine. But these are just models um for for what's really going on. Yeah. The way I describe it to my students to try to put it in a context that they can understand as i say think of octaves each octave is like another dimension the human ear can only hear a certain octave range but that doesn't mean sound beyond that doesn't exist just means you can't hear it so the simple analogy i give is if you get a dog whistle and blow it none of you are going to hear it but your dog will come running because that dog can hear in a dimension you cannot hear in so if you then take that and look at the vibrational spectrum, which I say runs from zero as no thing or complete stillness to zero infinity as every possible frequency. In other words, it just goes up to infinity. Then if you broke that into octave cycles, you would have the equivalent of dimensions. And it would, if you were to diagram it, it would look just like a layer cake, but it would just go in infinitely. And life exists on that sort of vertical tree, which is really the Kabbalah is showing sort of a tree like Mm. structure with the different dimensions. And so you've got, you know, the Ein Sof and the various dimensions, but they all come down into the earth at the bottom where they're all involved in creating what we're experiencing together. And, you know, many, many countless times, not only in shamanic journeys, but in my work with my soul i'm being taken into other dimensions like the astral realm is another dimension the noosphere is another dimension the causal sphere is a high probably the highest dimension that we can could perceive of because it's it's hard to measure anything that comes from there but we know it's coming from there in other words all we can use is some sort of a signifier to say where everything comes from like source but source is really the the uh, 
zero point at which all dimensions of any conceivable reality emerge. So zero and infinity are really mere images of each other. But uh, I, I really, really love talking to you, and I'm so grateful that you made the transition from the sort of the medical conundrum into your spiritual potential because it's a gift to all of us. You have uh, you have your course coming up uh, on how did we all get here? Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, if you want to find out more about that, that is that um, if you go to Dr. Mangia, so D R M A N J I R dot com, and then forward slash retreat twenty one, you'll find that. And um, is it okay to also talk about the long term? course that i've got up with a simply divine course yes i wanted to i i have a note here and i was just going to get into that i i as you know i had some computer challenges getting on and penny and i haven't had a chance to retry but what i was able to do is see all the headings of each of the sections of the lessons and i was just like this looks like a course i would have designed she's moving right along the lines i would sharing everything that i think is important um so I really love the material and I thought, God, the worst thing that would happen to my students if they studied this course is they would really get a reinforcement for what they learned at the Institute and pick up some new ideas as well. So uh, yeah, please talk about your Simply Divine course because for, for listeners that are interested in the concepts we're talking about, it looked to me like almost everything we've talked about today is in that course at some level. Mm, yeah, it's it's going a lot more deeply into what does... String theory, consciousness, fundamental, um, black hole principle. What does it mean for you? And uh, yes. one of the things is the implications for this um, antimatter matter timeline, the um, under C squared. And uh, you know, what does it mean from uh, to live from C squared? What does it mean for the law of attraction? You know, so it's a completely different reframing of um what you've learned so quantum physics is actually sitting inside the black hole principle so it's it's um reframing what you've learned about all these things from law of attraction and quantum physics and making sense of how we manifest you know what the mechanics of all that um how that all happens from the black hole perspective which is yeah. probably something that you've not considered before or heard before and uh, so, you know, going out into space and bringing it right down to the personal. Yeah, I'm excited to go through it myself and I'll, I'll have my tech wizard take whatever <laughs> changes. She did uh, do what you suggested. And as you know, we still had a hard time. But every now and then, you know, you get these interface problems and I'm yeah. a long ways away. But we'll, we'll get in there. I'm going to go through it. I, I respect you enough to devote the time to study it. and. Uh, that's a compliment, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. A big one. <laughs> it's some something quite simple, I'm sure. But if people want to um, uh, go through that, then we have a special um, offer for people listening to the show. Yes. Do you, do you want to share that? Do you know that off the top of your head, or yeah. you want Penny to put that in? It's um, D R M I A N J I R, as in Doctor Mangier. Doctor Mangier. Yeah. And if you go forward slash check as in C H E K, e -K. then um, you will get to um, the page that tells you more about the course. And then you click, and if you, you know, if this is something that you want to go ahead with, it gives you all the details um, or breaks it down module by module, what we're going to, what you're going to get. Um, you can either get it all at once or drip fed, depending on and how you prefer um and again so it's you, titled simply divine simply divine yeah so it's an easy guide to the science of spirituality so everything that we talked about packaged in like um these videos there's exercises there's worksheets there's um you know information diagrams and you'll also join uh the conscious science club which is where we meet on a monthly basis and uh so you know if you need support it's there you know, there's a forum and uh, that's where we, we hang out and uh, we talk about different subjects. So you will get, you know, if you want to bring up, bring up questions, I'm live with you in that forum. 
So it, it, if you get stuck. So, um, yeah. So if you go through you, um, and you're listening to this show, if you put in the, um, the coupon code check, um, so easy to remember. So drmangia.com forward slash check to get to the page. And then if you go through to the uh, shopping cart page, if you put in the coupon code check and you can pay by um, euros, dollars or British pounds. Um, so and choose which uh, method you want, you will get 25 percent off as well. Oh, that's so. a great discount. <laughs> wow. And so what's the price of the course? Um, I, in pounds, I think it's, um, I think it's about a hundred pounds with that, uh, with that, uh, deal as well, about 104, I think. I'm I don't sure know what think. the pound is in the dollars. It's still a really <laughs> yeah. reasonable yeah. price because there's yeah. quite a lot of sections in there. It must be like 20, yes. 25 sections. Okay. And you know, you may be thinking, gosh, I could, the videos are short. Everything is consumable. And, uh, as I said, you get all the support. The main thing is what what is going to do for you in terms of understanding how to live the black hole principle life and the freedom that you get from living the C squared. So once you realize what the antimatter and the matter dynamics are doing in your own life and living from C squared does, the liberation of that is um is what it makes it all worth it and understanding that framework so it it, it reframes i've taken thousands of people because i've been speaking on this for 20 years <laughs> over yeah. 20 years now so i've been taking yeah. people through this process and you know people getting that liberation of uh, the living from c squared concept in the black hole in their own life um, so we have that, and as as I said, if there if people do hear this before the retreat, so the retreat is just very soon, within two weeks. Um, so that's drmangia.com forward slash retreat twenty one. That is the how did we get here? Looking at the current situation and um, the multi dimensional aspects from ancient history and things like that to do with that. And then uh, the simply divine course is the ongoing course. Um, so if you go to drmangia.com forward slash check, <laughs> if you're listening to this and put in the coupon code, code check, you'll get um, the 25% off. And I uh, look forward to seeing you in the Conscious Science Club. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna get into it myself because I'm um, writing my new book right now and I'm doing all sorts of research to try to bring a, a synthesis of models together to create a coherent picture. And so your work is uh, already included in there as far as all the people that I've studied, which is a lot. Yes. And so uh, I wanted to go through it and just see if there's things that you're saying in ways that are better than how I'm saying them. So I can give you some credit in my book and say, this is what Manjir says. And here's how she rationalizes it. But uh, uh, are there any other websites or anything else you'd like to offer? Well, um, just uh, as a um, the main uh, website that I have, you can get to uh, by going to punkscience.com and you'll get there. So that's where the blogs are, the latest Punk Science TV um, with all the, if you're really into the astrophysics aspect of what I've just said, the Mars, the Enceladus, that sort of thing, water in space, <laughs> fossil fuels in space, that sort of thing, go to the website, punkscience.com. And, um, you know, so don't try and go to drmangia.com. You, it's just the forward slash website, short links that I've given. But if you want the main website, go straight to punkscience.com and you'll get to Punk Science TV and um all the episodes there um so um yeah <laughs> uh, thank you so much it's been wonderful speaking with someone who is so well read <laughs> just thank you yeah amazing <laughs> well you know it's important to me and you know i own an institute i've been doing this work for 37 years and uh, the institute i founded in 1995 it's a multidisciplinary institute for holistic health and high performance uh, conditioning. It looks at physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And, uh, you know, you've got a little sample of my work there. And uh, so it, it, this is all very important to me. And my podcast is really devoted to looking at all the things that we need to consider to, to truly reach our human potential and help make the world a better place for all living beings. Uh, and I think that's very, very important to know that they're all 
contributing to our lives and that it's important for us to remember to contribute to theirs instead of just being unconscious consumers. And so I really love finding people like you, studying uh, them, and then bringing them out to the audience. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be with you. And we got through, we're only on number four of 10 questions. So you know what that means? As soon as you're ready, let's finish our our uh, discussion if you're up for it. Oh, gosh, did we really? <laughs> That's amazing. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it was fun, though, and I had a great time, and I hope the listeners were as fascinated as I was. I really totally enjoyed it. So that's good. It just means I don't have to write another outline for the next round. And <laughs> I would love to to have you back whenever you're ready. And let's not only go through more, but let's share about whatever you've got available at the time and uh, see if we can support each other in the world and waking up. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I've learned a lot from you today as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm glad I could share something. I mean, <laughs> to teach someone like you something, that's quite a trick. <laughs> oh, we, we all learn from each other. When you stop learning, then <laughs> <You're dead>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everything's flat. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with me as well today. Thank you. All right. Well, lots of love, everybody. Enjoy <laughs> uh, Manjir's course and enjoy her online course. Enjoy learning how we all got here and enjoy learning what we are and what we can do to live and love fully. And uh, I'm sure you'll find it as interesting as our conversation today. Thank you all of you for sharing and for sharing the podcast and for being interested in how to be a more loving human being and contribute to the world in beautiful and meaningful ways. And thank you for anything you buy from the podcast sponsors. It helps support the podcast so I can devote the time to do the work and the research to find amazing people like Manjir Samantha Lawton. And uh, I look forward to talking to you guys next week with another amazing podcast. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. Manjir Samantha Lawton. You can find Manjir on Instagram at dr.mangia on Twitter at Dr. Mangia, and on Facebook at Punk Science. Visit her websites at paradigmrevolution.com or punksciencemovie.com. Mangia is offering listeners 25% off her Simply Divine course. To take advantage of this special offer, go to drmangia.com forward slash check. That's D-R-M-A-N-J-I-R dot com forward slash C H E K and enter the coupon code check. Mangia also offers multidimensional consultations. And if you would like to book one, go to drmangia.com forward slash M D. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check on Twitter at Paul check or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 D with Paul check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to check videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chikiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.